I'd like to welcome everybody to NSU this morning. We are honored to uh, continually host the uh, Battenfield Carletti Distinguished Entrepreneur Speaker Series. I'm told this is our 25th installment of the lecture series, which began in 2002. We are uh, joined not by uh, members of the speaker's family. His mother, Darlene, and brother Ryan are here with us. Um, we're also joined by uh, Dr. Harold and Mary Battenfield. And uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Ms. Janice Carletti, who's the uh, wife of the late uh, Dr. John Carletti, who could not be with us today. But it is because of the generous gift of the Battenfields and the Carlettis we're able to enjoy the successes that some of our alumni have had in recent years and are able to come back and provide some of their uh, lessons learned and wisdom as an inspiration to the students in the future. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the Dean of the College of Business and Technology, Doc, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Roger Collier, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Arant. Before I introduce the speaker, just a couple things. Um, you all, some of you may be doing math in your head and thinking from 2002 to 2016, how does that 25 uh, speakers, uh, installments of the speaker series, for a long time we did two of these a year, one in the fall, one in the spring, and that's, that's why there was more. You also might look at the back of your program and there's a whole bunch more than 25 names here. Well, that's because some of the on some of the series we had more than one speaker. So we're not out of our minds. It really is 25, even though it, does, it doesn't look like it. Uh, students, those of you who are here for uh, credit, uh, we're uh, stepping up our technology game. Since we have a technology speaker, we thought maybe we'd you know, join the 21st century. So instead of having sign-up sheets, we are gonna scan your ID on your way out. So there's a table outside here. Please be sure and stop by. We'll scan your, your ID and let your professors know that you were here. If you don't have your ID, don't panic. We'll have a sign-up sheet as a backup. <clears throat> Our speaker this morning is Reg Snodgrass. I, I just met Mr. Snodgrass this morning. I know we're in for a treat. He's a 2009 graduate of NSU. Um, Anita Thompson and he hung out. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but anyway. Um, he's here to talk to us about wearable technology and IOT, the Internet of Things. I admit I have no idea what that means, so I'm looking forward to uh, our speaker this morning, Red Snodgrass. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, everybody. Um, I'm just, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I did see some mass panic and some text messages go out when they said they were gonna be scanning badges because people were like, oh, I can't scan you in. So there'll be, probably be some people coming in in a little bit, which is great. You know, I, like, look, uh, being an entrepreneur is, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I think has defined uh, my life. And it's one of the things that's defined me it defines my friend group. It defines what I read, what I think about at 4, 5, 6, um, 11, 12, 1 a.m. Every bit and aspect of your life is consumed when you're an entrepreneur. Um, and, and, you know, we've got to this point in society with shows and TV, you know, stations that are out there where we, we throw this huge aspirational picture of what an entrepreneur is. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's grimy, it's gritty, it is, it is uh, a daily um, ritual. You know, how many of you guys know who Sisyphus was, right? Sisyphus is this guy that rolls this rock up a hill, and at the end of every day, the rock just rolls back down on top of Sisyphus. And, you know, being an entrepreneur is like that, except it's more like seven or eight rocks that you're pushing up. And, um, and they all somehow not only roll over you as you go down the hill, but they land on top of you when you finish. And I laughed at one point in time, um, speaking to one of my mentors, and we'll get into this a little bit about who I am, because um, it's relevant, I think, and a little bit about what I built, because it's relevant, too. And I, I looked up about four months ago, and I, I, I said to um, Randy Haken, and Randy was on the founding team of Yahoo. He's one of my advisors. 
did the SoftBank deal that took Yahoo in the in the um, Japan. Like Randy is amazing. Um, for him to like work for me was an, in, impossible. And so if you guys are really interested in being an entrepreneur, write this down. This is super important. If you want to be successful, you have to figure out how to get people who have no business on earth working for you to work for you, <laughs> right? Religiously, dogmatically, emphatically work for you. Mark Zuckerberg got Sheryl Sandberg long before he was Mark Zuckerberg, right? And I learned this advice from Manish Chandra, who founded Poshmark. They do about a million dollars a day in mobile revenue. Like Manish told me that, and it blew my mind. And after that, I quit, you know, hiring wrong Randy. Anyway, so I was talking to Randy, and I looked up and I said to him, "Just a little bit more, and I'll be successful." You know, and it was a, it was a real like hard moment for me, you know, because you know we were, you know, closing a venture round, um, and the round was about uh, it ended up being about four and a half million dollars, and it was in the throes of that. When you're in the throes of raising a round, right, it just penetrates every bit of you. It's all you think about because you have 30, 40, 50 people that work for you, that have families, that rely on you. You know, no matter whether or not they do their job, it's your responsibility to pay them. And so that is the sheer weight of being an entrepreneur on you daily. And so I look at Randy, you know, with that face, and I say to him, you know, I just a little bit and I'll be successful. And Randy said to me, you already are, stop, right? That's a long way to get to from the seat you guys are in into where you, you know, get to be an entrepreneur. So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit about my high level story, right? Um, I think that that's a good teaser and because I've got 45 minutes and it's rare when people give me 45 minutes to talk uninterrupted. <laughs> I'm gonna talk a lot about me. So, um, just kidding. So basically, um, I left NSU, I think, 2005, and trying to figure out like a lot of like where you guys are going to be, like what do I want to do, who am I going to be. Um, I left before I graduated because I'd just been in university so long, it was just time, hey. It's like eight years in. Like Anita had got four degrees before I'd even, <laughs> you know, she'll give me a third later. So, so where I got my degrees and everything else like that um, was, was more from grit and from earnestness. I worked at several different you know, companies along the way. I sold cars. I tried everything. Um, I was in Los Angeles when I got a call. And the call was, hey, you know, we've got this warranty program that you know, is around autos. You've got some auto experience. Why don't you come join Square Trade? Have you guys ever heard of Square Trade? Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Like, um, so they used to be an arbitrator for eBay. And what they would do is they would like, tell people like, um, oh, you know, we'll settle your disputes or whatever, but they needed a real business. And I was brought in as an intern, right, to help them figure out what the real business is. Mark Sharon, um, who's now CEO of a trip advisor for Europe and Asia, was my boss. Um, Jay Nath was um, on the team. He's the CIO for the city of San Francisco. It was like all-star stellar team. And me, kind of, you know, a little bit brash, brood, sales guy, Maldi, um, came on board. Within six months, this is my first startup, we created a program. I was managing a third of the company, like, and we were doing about um, $1.5 million in revenue a month, which is 3x all the other revenue divisions combined. And I was hooked on entrepreneurship. It was like a drug. You know, let's go bigger, let's go faster, let's get this all in. You know, I had 45 people, and I watched that implode in front of me, like, disastrously. And I had to lay off a bunch of people. And so it was pretty hard, and I uh, tried to do a couple other different startups. Um, we looked at different kind of programs and stuff. And I started looking into the Facebook and the Facebook platform and started working on apps. And I thought, hey, you know, I'm going to go to Oklahoma because I can get engineers cheap. I've got plenty of money. So I came back here, worked part time and had an engineer and learned all about Facebook and Facebook apps and could not get investment to save my life. You know, I had business plans. I was slick. I thought I was smarter than everybody. Yeah, honestly, the business plan is exactly what uh, Mark Pincus, who I got to meet later on, Mark Pincus did uh, uh, Zynga. Right, same, same business. You guys have heard Zynga, right? So, you know, I learned a lot about the environment there, too. I learned that, you know, you've got to be where investors are. You've got to be where people actually want to, to invest in the things that you do. Um, and so with, from that environment, I realized that the best place for me would be to go back to San Francisco. And so I slugged back to San Francisco. I slept on couches. 
And so that's really important, right? You don't have to be smart or innovative to be a successful entrepreneur. You just have to be doggedly, like, almost stupid to a stubborn point to be successful. You have to be stubborn. You have to move your body forward. Travis Kalanick, who I dislike tremendously, um, um, you know, from Uber, and, and I actually know Travis, right? I took him to Dallas with me. I dislike him. <laughs> you know, he's, you know, his entrepreneurship is very old world. It's not my style. I don't think he's a good representation for what a successful entrepreneur should look like. Um, that's why. It's, it has nothing to do. I think he's a brilliant business person. Uh, I really do. <clears throat> but what I, what, I, what I learned from that, right, is like Travis slept in his car, right, for a month, right? I respect him for that in order to get his business off the ground. I, you know, I don't know how many billions of dollars like, Uber is worth right now, but um, I, I, I think Garrett's the guy that actually built the company. Uh, Garrett built Stumble Upon. Anyway, so, so you have to have that kind of dogged determination. And I got a job at Under the Radar and Dealmaker Media. And what it did when I got that job is I positioned myself in the center of where everybody in the valley came, all the thought leaders, all the communicators. And I worked, you know, in a low-level position, learning, hustling, getting to know people, getting to understand the market, getting to understand how the valley worked. And so guess what happened next? A startup came around. Um, called Scout, S-K-O-U-T, small band of Swedish guys, right? Sounds like ABBA. Um, and um, these guys were building a mobile app, right? Had no business model, nothing around it. And they said, okay, I want you to be, you know, come on business development. I said, I'll, I'll do that, but I gotta be SVP of business development, which inflated my title, right? But, but you, you just, you need to always think about what the next thing is you're gonna do. You know, always think about how you position yourself to be successful in that next rung. Um, but at Scout, it was such a journey. We ended up eventually, you know, I'm still an advisor of the company, raising $20 million from Mark Andreessen. You guys know who Mark Andreessen is? He, um, Mark Andreessen is the number one venture capitalist in the Valley, um, world renowned, right? Probably, you know, five, $10 billion in venture capital underneath their, their investments. Everything that you've seen, uh, Mark Andreessen's on the board of Facebook. Right. So they put, ended up putting $20 million into us, but we ended up building uh, the dating app uh, called Scout, and it's got about 100 million users globally. And that <laughs> was all hustle and determination. I took a job where I probably paid myself about a third of what I was worth to struggle to fight with a bunch of, of guys to try to create a new type of paradigm. So um, we basically launched one of the most successful like, dating applications that were out there. That whole entire process from a distance looks, wow, you know, they're on TV, they're in the Wall Street Journal, they're doing all these things. It was nothing short of pain, right? Because every day you've got, you've got technology that you're building that you need to make work. You've got business partners. And by the way, like, I, I, have you guys ever heard of the Greek god Hephaestus, right? You got, can anyone tell me what he's like the god of? Like fire, technology. Right? He's got like a limp. Have you ever noticed that? It's because all technology is always broken, <laughs> right? The Greeks figured this out a long time ago, you know? Um, and so, like, you're constantly fighting. We were onboarding a million users a month, right? Um, and, you know, like, I can go into some of the crazier things that we had to deal with. Um, pictures, un unadulterated pictures. You would think iPhone users are more appropriate than they were. They were not. We had to create a whole system to delete pictures um, with Mechanical Turk, right? Um, we needed to do payments because we had to make money on our app. Like, as a dating app, how do you make money? Well, maybe you block different things. We had to hack PayPal, like, inadvertently, so that we could do in-app purchases before PayPal happened, right? And because of all those innovative and creative things, one time, like, have you guys ever seen those touch tune jukeboxes? I know you got one at Ned's. Have you guys ever seen one of those? So we took our technology and embedded it on a touch tune box so that whenever you went to, like, buy, like, a song or something, you'd be able to see single people around you, and you'd be able to send the song to them in, in their phone, right? Pretty cool stuff. All the hustle to figure out how to build this company, right? You have to be flexible. You have to be, um, you know, there's, a, you know, Sun Tzu is great. You guys ever hear of read, read Sun Tzu? Um, it's a really brilliant, like, book that talks about strategy, right? And when you're in a startup, right, and when you're moving through the startup, the thing that you need to be able to do is understand what the environment is, right? Understand what the climate is from the environment, right? See where the trends are going in the marketplace. And then you set up your mission 
to basically handle those different types of pieces that are coming out based on your interpretation of what the climate or the marketplace is, right? And then you create your command structure, right? You create your team that can actually handle that market and can deliver it. And then you come up with methods to actually deliver and interpret that. Anyways, we'll get there. Um, so, so, so back to this entrepreneurial thing. Like, so we, we, I went through all that. Um, because I did this, I got the, the eyes of Bell Labs and Alcatel-Lucent. How many of you guys have ever heard of Bell Labs? Raise your hand. Right? It's like this guy named Alexander Graham Bell, he, he built this thing called the telephone. Right? And then after the telephone, he built a whole bunch of really cool things. Uh, lasers. <laughs> Seriously, like the laser beam, you know, I'm like, I have to, got to see one, it's super dope. Um, but all these technological inventions, the motion picture camera, all came out of Bell Labs. They are, have been working on a problem because what's been happening is as our network consumption, like as we like want bigger, better cell phones and more pictures and everything else like that in the world, like as that kind of like grows, um, what happens is, is, is the business models start to break. And so right now, like our bigger infrastructure isn't really paying for itself. So our cell phone plans are like not necessarily at the right rate, but it's really a broken business model problem. Somehow, I, I don't know what they were doing, but they, went, they lost their minds, but they saw that I was able to interpret business models. And so Bell Labs came, gave me like an offer I can't refuse, you know, I mean, you know, that kind of thing. And I went and spent the next three years of my life traveling the world, looking at entrepreneurs all over the world. Right, and so um, when Mukesh Ambani bought the 4G spectrum of India, basically he owned all the, he's a big dude, he owns a billion dollar home. You should check it out, it's really cool. So I got to fly in there, work with that entire entrepreneur community about like new business models around mobile. Or, um, I, you know, I was in Auckland, I was in Europe a lot, like working with, you know, how do we create, you know, the whole mobile wallet payment thing that, that happens there? I did that, and I built a couple other products for AT&T but what got me really excited, right, was this entrepreneurship thing. And this is all going to what I, like, kind of built and put together. I'm giving you guys kind of a roadmap. Is we started creating things called gravity center points around the world where I, I would um, go in and I, I call it eminent domain. And so when you're, when you're an executive at a big company, you have to fight with everybody to get anything done. And so I just went to our, our team that, like, owned all the property and said, uh, these four offices are empty. I own them now. I'm just going to take them over. And, uh, you know, and they kind of had to say, okay, because I had the CEO on my side. And we put um, places for entrepreneurs to go and to set up. And one of the most successful ones that we did was in uh, Dallas, Texas, right? Dallas, Texas, that's where I brought Travis. It gets back to that, right? I uh, bought a bunch of entrepreneurs there. But we started giving away space for free. I put it on top of AT&T's Foundry program that was there. And uh, basically what happened at the end of, of that was, um, you know, first year we had $35 million in investment into those 35 startups and like a lot of things were really starting to kind of vibe in the space. I left <laughs> and decided to start my own company, right? This is like, you know, I tried a few times and didn't really get off the ground. This was finally me thinking that I understood everything. This is before this company, right? And it was called Taploid. And basically, um, you know, what Taploid did is just, I was really starting to get into the Internet of Things, right? And how many of you guys have heard of the Internet of Things, All right? Not a lot of people, like, it, no one knows what it means. There have been, two, there have been 2,000 um, large corporations make announcements around the Internet of Things, and I spoke to probably about, you know, 30 or 40 of the CMO, CTO, and CIO groups there, and they're all, they are all asking us what they should do. Right, you know, and if they're asking me what they should do, they're probably in trouble. No, I'm just no, but um, but seriously, like we we worked really um, really hard with a lot of these bigger corporations to kind of make this interpretation around it. But back to the tabloid, right? It was uh, we basically combed through all your social network data, all your Facebook, and we could understand um, you know which of your friends is more, most likely a Democrat, um, who's who's going to be who is more, most likely pregnant. But we got to the point where we could actually tell you. Um, with a strong likelihood of who you broke up with, when you were gonna break up with your girlfriend and who you were gonna date next, right? And so we started taking all this data and really trying to kind of understand it. It just wasn't the thing that I wanted to base my life on because you still have to struggle no matter how fun your company is. So the next principle that I want you guys to kind of take away from is this, is that 
you know, no matter what you build, like large or small or in between, it is going to suck the entire life out of your, you know, you. Everything it is just going to like, it's going to beat you up. And so if if the risk faces the rewards, right? And uh, and all things are equal, you're going to have the same amount of pain. Swing big, right? You know, your your life is very very short, and the time that you have on it when you can operate at a level that's really strong. I mean, I work about 18 hours a day, and I put about you know maybe 30, 40,000 miles in a month on an airplane um, right now. So so I'm I'm feeling the burn, right? I can't do this forever, and so when you commit and you dedicate what you want to do, try to dedicate something, um, to try to dedicate your life to something that has like maximum impact, well, you know, over a lot of money. Like just don't aim small and like waste your life on struggling for something that inevitably doesn't benefit anyone, even yourself. So um, that's kind of like the, the last thing. Now, okay, so I want to go through like what I built really quick and then I'm going to show you guys this because I think, I think you really appreciate it. Um, and. Uh, and so you'll kind of understand why I'm up here. Let's go ahead and switch over to the laptop, guys, if we can. I was told to be a little bit pixelated. All right, so, um, so this is my company. And like, the first thing that I wanted to do was, was figure out what I was really good at and where my niche would be. And so with, um, with where wearables was going, and by the way, I don't know if you guys have seen this number. Do you guys know how big that number is? Right? That's you know, global economy big. Um, right now, they estimate the market, when it, which was nascent when we started, to be about $11 trillion. My last um, you know, conversation with the Gartner analysts basically said, we're not even going to put a number out, which is funny because analysts sell papers based on numbers, right? They just always put a bigger number up. That's how you like, kind of upstage the other guy. And these guys like, the number's too big. Can't quantify it. So we went in what we thought was a niche market, and um, we were able to build the top like innovation creator, according to Forbes, like we're a top five accelerator around the world, like Y Combinator, 500 startups. We're in the same league as all these other big guys. Um, top 1% of 1% of 1%, like this is five. Forbes listed us as that, and we're the only ones focused on this IoT marketplace. So we're generating a good deal of the innovation, or we're touching and influencing a good deal of the innovation of a small niche market. Um, we start at once because what I wanted to do was own a whole platform to take a product to market. So if you own the media and the events in a marketplace and you own like the email database and you own all the manufacturer relationships, all the distribution relationships, everything else like that, you create a, an efficient system, right? And so as an entrepreneur, always try to find ways to create systems of efficiency, right, in virtuous cycles. <laughs> Virtual cycles, it's not a bicycle you ride around. What it is, is it's, it's something that when you, when you um, embolden one pillar, it makes the other pillar stronger, right, in your system. And so when my media company gets stronger, my events company gets stronger. When my events company gets stronger, I actually get better startups to look at me because I get to curate from five million. It, it's called deal flow, and it gives me the biggest in the world. And so then each time, then as my startups get bigger, guess what? My news and media arm gets bigger because we start breaking more stories. And so I've created a virtuous cycle. Um, and the way that I did that is I got these great guys up here. Um, three of these guys are World Economic Forum fellows. Andreas Wagen created the one click. So I leveraged all my relationships to talk to people who are way better, <laughs> smarter and better. Peter Hirschberg at Apple. Andy's a great friend. You have to Google what Steve Jobs called him at Apple. It's profane. Um, it, it, it's on his business card. But he built the iPhone. And he also built Palm OS, right? Um, he's an incredible human being. Robert Scoble is one of the most influential people in media and tech today. So I created a group around me that could create an influence and create an influence success. And then I picked verticals. So then I picked my market based on who were going to be the most rising verticals around here? I thought smart cities, automotive, banking and finance, retail, healthcare, and insurance. So how do I get people in there to ensure that my startups are successful? And so what I did was I got great investors. Um, Rick Wagner was, uh, was the former chairman of the board of General Motors. He actually was fired by Obama. You know, personally, Rick is on board, and he actually takes trips with us. Not only do I get him to invest, but I get him to work. Every time you get money, make your investors work, or it's, it's not worth it. Actually, take the money when you can get it. <laughs> but Bon and Bao, like he's president of Mondelez. That's Oreo. That's Kraft. He's got a four billion dollar marketing budget, 
you know, he can help me out with retail. And so I made sure that I stacked the, the place with people that were incredibly awesome and really tough in order to ensure success for my companies and my startups. This is actually the end result after the two years, right? Uh, I don't normally show this slide, so don't tweet it out or anything, but it's really, it's 92 companies and it's 100 million raised and it's about 7 million in crowdfunding. We've helped this many startups raise money. We own equity in this many companies already. Portfolio value is pretty big, I'll tell it offline, but what was really great is I realized we had a 90% fund rate, right? And, uh, and, and like all of the startups that come through us, they receive cash after they leave from us through our network 90% of the times, which impacts big global markets. And so we created a playbook, right? All the problems and issues that an entrepreneur has um, are up here, right? And then directly we have partnerships, like if you need to learn how to grow a viral thing, the guy that built Facebook Connect, Josh Ellman, comes in and talks to you. So we've created this network to bring all these guys together, right? And then we start working with the big companies, right, and getting them involved so we can understand their roadmaps and we can understand where the products are going in the future. By understanding where the big companies' product roadmaps are, we get a good chance to understand the climate. We shift our mission on which startups we want, and then we can sit there and we can impact, right, our methods to create real change in the overall market. It's that virtuous loop, it's that virtual cycle that we do. I got the guys, have you guys ever heard of TechCrunch? It's the number one blog, the guys in, in technology, the guys that founded it now work for me, right? And so I've got them on board to help me build a great media company, because again, it's about creating that virtuous cycle. And then I got great partners, and so these are some of the companies that work with us. We're working with the C-level executives at most of these startups and everything, because what we realize is the market needs to understand, just like, just like what you said, Roger, I don't know what IoT means, nobody knew what it meant, right? And everybody, they, these guys have big billion dollar bets on it. So we were able to get there, impact that, inf influence it. Read right is big, right? And so now we have this big media property pushing those things along. Again, it's all about creating the virtuous cycle. It's all about pulling those things in. Um, I won't bore you with our events. This is a great thing that we did. We realized that cities need help. And so Jay Nath, who did that startup with me at Square Trade, right, is now the CIO of the city of San Francisco. Through building relationships, right, it's very important for an entrepreneur, don't burn people down, right? You're not gonna be a, 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 a Dell Carnegie and get away with any of that stuff, right? You gotta have money before you burn people like that. And even then, like, why would you wanna live that way? You know, um, there are plenty of people, and most of the people that are building the products that are successful today, Oculus Rift, um, or uh, the Misfit wearables, and all these other things that are like really getting acquired and purchased, they're great human beings. Because there's something new and different in technology, you know? My buddy Bram that built BitTorrent is very engineered, is engineered very differently than my friends that are being successful in wearable and, and IoT technology. So, um, a couple more slides. Now, this is the most important thing that I'm working on today, right? Um, one of the things that we notice, again, it's all about being flexible, it's all about understanding the market. All these startups were going to China and Hong Kong, they were all very uncomfortable with doing business. And so we looked and broke down the market based on geographical regions around what's, you know, where people are strongest. And we said, ideation and business models, yeah, that's in the US. Everyone acknowledges that we're good at, we're great at marketing. Americans, the world, are world renowned for being incredible at talking about ourselves, and people appreciate it. It's okay to use it, right? So uh, rapid precision prototyping that happens in Taiwan, um, the sandbox stuff you don't get, don't worry about it, product iteration, finalization, after you tinker your product and test it in market, you put it together. And so what we've done now is we've partnered. We've got MOUs with the tech, Minister of Technology for Taiwan and everywhere. Um, we got investors like, uh, out of the space, Tsinghua's Alumni Association, Radiant VC, these are the strongest investors in market that are helping us understand the market. And now I, I remove um, the Taiwanese flag because <laughs> um, it's offensive to Chinese people, always know and understand your audience, but we are setting up a, a pathway or a highway where governments are funding our companies to go over and do business in very protected IP regions around the world, right? And really accelerating business to market, like in mass. And so, yeah, I mean, from two and a half years of, hey, let's do this idea, we've been able to kind of garner this. Here's a couple of nice quotes from the government there, but that's not there. Um, but when we launched, we're in 150 articles around um, the world, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, um, all these different press things. 
because what we were able to do is really understand, like another really big important thing is understanding um, market need. If you can understand and identify market need and resonate your message, like your press and your PR isn't hard, right? I love my PR team, right? They're amazing. Um, but if you, your PR team is only as good as your message to market, like no matter how much you pay them, they're not gonna be able to impact and change whether or not what you have is resonating. Anyways, um, this is what my company looks like today. Right now, so we've got offices in San Francisco, um, Hong Kong, and Shenzhen. Um, this is what my company looks like. Actually, this is probably what my company looks like at the end of the year um, with this new investment that we're, we're having. Mike, my, my CFO's not here, so I can say that on stage. Um, and then this is, this is really what um, the company's gonna look like in 2017, 2018. And so like, we will, we'll be producing around 150 to 200 startups a year that we own equity in, um, and we'll have a venture fund to help kind of pull it all through. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's been, I laugh, I say that this, this white was my first startup that I did scout, this one is my second. Um, I looked a lot younger when I started this company, but that's just probably because I was a lot younger. Um, anyways, uh, I, like, I've got plenty of time for q and I'm here to get back. I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, so I was a university student. I was actually a, a debater here. I wish uh, David Scott could be here. I guess he's moved on. But um, I, you know, the university actually helped me um, pay for my school right, uh, through, through debate. And so I'm very grateful for what the university's done. And, and honestly, like, I'm here to help. Um, you know, I, I'm looking for diamonds in the rough, right? Students that um, you know, are okay with going through that kind of bit of pain um, and process. Like, I would love to look at you guys as entrepreneurs. Um, if you're in marketing or, or technology or business analytics or anything else like that, um, I'd definitely love to talk to you. Um, we've got internships around. Um, pretty competitive, but I'm very nepotistic. So. Um, it's just kind of, I guess it's, it's part of what, you know, I guess being an entrepreneur, that's the last thing is like, you know, for the people that help you out and are good to you, man, fight for those people, they're rare. Um, and when you have them, like nurture that relationship and you can build really strong clusters of people where guys like, you know, um, the chief scientist of Amazon, I mean, that guy, um, Andreas actually invented the one click, right? And he's on my executive board helping me out. Not because I'm awesome, I'm not, right? it's because, uh, you know, of a relationship. And, you know, he sees the vision. So anyway, ask away, tons of questions. Everything is open. Like, I don't hold anything back. Um, I even think I have my phone number on the blog when I bought the publication because when I bought it, people were so <laughs> stressed out about it. And I just said, hey, just call me or text me. Um, got some weird pictures once. That was kind of funny. Um, but um, I did, like, being CEO, I answer tweets that go directly to the publication or any criticism. I, like, go straight at it. I'm just like, hey, thank you so much. You know, and people are like, wow, the CEO of this, which I don't think that that's there. It's kind of stupid. But anyway, questions? <laughs> Should I? Yeah, okay, so um, I didn't have my degree. I was, like, some, some unit short, and uh, I was, Bell Labs, I mean, they have six Nobel Prize winners. They're not gonna let me be an executive at Bell Labs unless I have a degree. So I called the university, I, had, I was a couple credits shy, but I, I had probably about 100 credits over like most other degrees. So we worked it out and the university did me a really good solid. Um, and that's why I graduated 2009. Um, and they let me do some continuing education stuff. So I was, uh, like, that was my promise. I was like, look, if you guys work this out for me, like, I'll definitely, like, I wanna help out. Right? I'm getting this role, I'm getting these jobs because you know, um, of my environment and my experience. And it has as much to do with how I learned culturally to interact with people while I was here at NSU, how to love people, how to like, you know, um, give and not like demand back. It works really great in my business deals in Asia. Right? Um, there's actually a lot of them. And when you see it, you'll be like, oh, that's actually kind of cool. Um, anyway, yeah, I hope that was good. Yeah, I love, I, you know, and um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm gonna get my next degree from a really prestigious university out of China. So um, I'm pretty excited about that too. So I'm like taking classes there, you know, probably starting in the next few months as part of my deal. So you guys have an international like 
you know, student abroad, I guess. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, let's, let's bring it down. Usually, like, my slides talk about that, too, but um, the Internet of Things is basically the micronization of sensors. Right now, you have probably 13, 14 sensors on you. It's called your mobile phone, right? And it can take all these different things. What the Internet of Things is really doing is taking sensors and putting them all over us, all over the world, um, basically making, you know, the world co writable, codable, right? And, and uh, you know, how do I explain it? So pretty soon, like, you'll have all these sensors over you, and you'll be able to quantify things like emotion, right? Very important. You know, how do I feel today? Um, one of the startups that we're working with um, allows for mothers and, to continue to hear the, the heartbeats of their children after they're born, and for children to continue to hear the heartbeat of the mother after they're born, right? And so it's, it's the beginning phases of connecting all these things that, you know, we've just kind of deemed should be smart. There's no other reason other than we've just kind of said collectively as a species, we want our stuff to think, right? And so what's happening is we're putting chips and everything and they're becoming aware. And so even the sensors that are on you um, or the sensors that are on your phone, they're constantly trying to understand what's going on around, right? It's, it's still trying, but it's really like really tiny. It doesn't get a good picture of the information. The Internet of Things is going to put, like, I spoke to the CTO of um, Singapore, Myun Yin, and Myun's like, I want to put a sensor on every tree branch, tree branch. I was like, Myun, seriously? But, like, what he's saying is, like, um, pretty soon we're going to be able to garner data uh, from about wind, we're going to be able to garner data about trees, we're going to be able to garner data about ourselves, right, in ways where it's actually understandable, right? And so, all right, so, so what? Who cares why do I want the data? That's an important question, right? Because right now, most of the people that are dictating about, you know, what that should be really don't have a clue. Um, we think that we do. And so we're trying to put a message out there. And one of those messages is this. So one of our startups is called Sensum. And Sensum is really cool. Uh, we did a, a video, they did a movie. And when they did the movie um, at South By, we debuted it. The movie would sit there and, like, you had some, you know, regular sensors, not like you didn't look like you were in an experiment. You have just a couple sensors. They would be able to understand how frightened you were of this horror movie as it went along. And if you weren't scared enough, they'd whisper behind you, I'm right behind you, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so they were able to kind of impact and understand it. Now, um, have you guys seen the, ugh, probably not, there's this REI commercial or it's like all this like really cool action stuff. And then all of a sudden, this girl just like falls. And like the first time I saw the commercial, I was like, whoa, you know, for lots of reasons. And, 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 the, and the second time that I saw the commercial, I was like, you know, what are they doing? And so what they're basically doing is they understand now that, you know, I don't know if you guys ever watched commercials from the 60s, but you, you, they're, they're horrible, right? You're like, what? like, did people buy this stuff? Like, really? Like, like, did they really put a woman like that? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's like really offensive. But, but so, so things have evolved. And now, like, as we evolved with, like, the, the media and everything today, so we're not as sensitive to the things in the past. Um, we can now quantify emotion. So that mother's heartbeat of her child one day will turn into emotional patterns. And when I was talking to the CMO of Mondelez, which owns Oreo and um, like Nabisco and Triscuit and all these different things, I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing for grandma to tell mom, don't feed your kids sugar, because mom looks at grandma and says, you fed me sugar my whole life. It's a whole nother thing whenever you get a device and the data comes back and it says if the kid eats a candy bar, they feel like crap the rest of the day, right? Like pretty soon people aren't gonna buy your stuff. And pretty soon people are gonna look at the emotion because we can now quantify emotion of how they feel with what they eat. And so emotion is gonna come into everything that you buy as a quantifiable score, it already does, right? So look at patterns that already exist in society and overlay what's gonna happen. And so pretty soon, buying decisions are going to be based off of emotional, like, how does this make me feel long term? What's the long term value of this product, this candy bar for me, right? It's nil, because I feel like crap because my butt gets big, right? I mean, it's like there's all kinds of things that are happening. So what the Internet of Things is, is it's this allowance of us to pull data from the world, right, with all these different center, sens sensors, and make understandable decisions as, like, human master race, right? Um, and what AI does is AI comes in and pulls all that data and tries to make it as understandable for us and make decisions for us so that when I come here next, right, 
I land um, on my American Airlines jet. I walk outside. My Uber is picking me up. I sit down. I don't say anything to the driver. It drives me to the hotel. I walk into the hotel. It knows that I'm there. Um, I walk up to my already ready room, and it says, Do you, Mr. Snodgrass, would you like a pizza? We know that you've been in Hong Kong for quite some time, and you're tired of like, all the, the food with the faces on it. <laughs> I mean, if you ever eat in Asia, like, there's always the head with the food. It always comes out 100% of the time. It's, you know, don't eat the head. It doesn't make you look cool. You'll only like, not feel cool at all. Anyway, I, I didn't try it. Um, so yeah, so, so back to the Internet of Things, right, and why it matters. That one instance about humanity and relationships is played off like I've got probably, you know, a thousand use cases across the industry that we're working with to get, like, you know, we work with GE um, a lot to talk about it. I mean, most of the bigger, uh, City, um, Citibank, um, you know, we did, uh, the C global CTO of Citibank is one of our advisors, right? When the, when the bank went down in Egypt, he was in charge. And so we work with banks to understand how is this going to affect capital markets? Because like the reason why like I'm really geeked out about this too is like you guys like see Uber and Lyft. How many of you guys know Uber and Lyft? Seems like an amazing thing. I mean, people get paid like 25, 30 bucks an hour instead of going to work for McDonald's for really cheap. I love the concepts. The thing that I don't like about the concepts is as soon as like self-driving cars come out, those guys all get fired. Then there's all this huge job gap that they're they're creating. So they're creating this sucking job gap that's going to be a huge, huge problem and issue. And so, yeah, I work with Sidecar and, and some of the guys there that are another rideshare service because I'm really concerned about things like that, right? Um, anyway, so off on like lots of tangents, but essentially like the Internet of Things is, is basically helping us understand who we are. And when my book comes out, I hope we'll like pass it all around. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. What about I, I think that's a great um, thing. It, pro Trying to match my audience because I can say this all over. I like I can say this all over Europe. I can't say it here. So um, trying to think think of the right analogy. So um, privacy needs to be handled responsibly, and we need to teach entrepreneurs how to handle it responsibly. What happens in Europe, right? And Europeans are very different than us. Europeans are nervous or worried about um, uh, uh, like uh, the the Europeans are worried about corporates having their data. They don't care about if the government does, right? Us, like we don't care if um, corporations have our data, but we're really concerned if you know the government does. It's just a weird, like we're just kind of the opposite. What I tell people is, is that data is like uh, you, you have to like create a contract with your user where you use the data to create a better product. The majority of what Facebook does with your data is they try to create a better product to get you more hooked and more addicted to the product, right? And that's the kind of contract that you want. What you have to do is you have to use the data. You have to leverage it. Otherwise, you don't get the pieces that you need to create better products to improve the products to a state where they actually matter in people's lives. And so the trade-off should be very transparent and open. But they're, like, you have to use, you have to leverage data. Um, security and privacy, I get it. But like, security, will, no matter how secure you think you are, talk to John McAfee. You're not. Right? And, and systems evolve no matter what. There's a certain level of like, effort that you have to get into, but you have to always understand you're going to get hacked because people are just inevitably smarter than you, no matter how smart you are. I mean, we work with the chief architect of um, security for McAfee. Right? So i like big on the, the privacy and security thing, but I think people have it wrong. If you te teach people just don't do it, the only people that do it are irresponsible with it. They make bad decisions, and people get hurt. That's my, you draw the analogy there. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? I don't want everybody to get hungry. I saw some guys had to leave for class. So in the future, almost everything is going to be integrated with some form of tech, like in any way it is. And so I look at other mar I look at markets before I look at technology, um, because if you you're not good at technology like that, I can fix. Like we've got relationships with the right people, or I 
like, you know, a lot of my friends have exits, right? Um, a lot of them have sold their companies, and now they're like, well, what do I do next? And so I've created a very easy platform for them to kind of get started again and do the next thing. Most of them have money, um, but like they'll, like they'll look for interns. Um, I just had somebody I hadn't seen since he was six years old um, come and stay at my house for three days. Um, he's like, he was six, and now he's this giant monster human being, right? He's a big old Oklahoma boy, ate lots of, you know, you know steak and taters. But um, yeah, like uh, he came and he got an internship in literally like a weekend, right? Because there is, like if you're smart and if you're capable, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. If you can do the task right in front of you, people will love you until you can't do that task. It's never a family. It's always a sports team, right? Sports teams feel like family, but they're not. Rich, I think you've kind of jumped in quickly to uh, where you have been since you've been here. But I think you'd be remiss. And, and I, know I think you'd be remiss in not telling me where you really came from. Because I think, not, not because of the relationship we have, but I think there's something to be said for that homegrown boy. Yeah, I mean, I, like, look, I, when I went to the Valley, like, I had a cousin or two. I didn't know anybody. Um, you know, I I graduated from Tahlequah High School. You know, I um, you know I, I went to Oklahoma Baptist for a little bit. wasn't the right fit for me. Um, and I, I graduated from NSU. And so, you know, when you leave, and I actually I graduated. Like people are complaining, I graduated in the worst economic time, which is what everyone says when they graduate, right? It's the worst economic time to find a job. Um, you, you share that with everybody. Welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like, it was a struggle, man. Like, I tried so many different things just to get started. And that's, I think, um, and I, we, we, weren't, we weren't rich at all, right? <laughs> it's my single mother, you know, hanging out with me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I didn't have, like, a lot of anything. What I did have is people that would let me sleep on the couch, you know? Um, and I had a positive attitude, and I knew that I would just go and make it happen. Right, that's the thing, right? You have to move from thinking that ideas matter, ideas don't matter. What matters is execution. Because everyone can dream up like lofty goals and ideas. Um, my life has been one constant execution, um, like, like, and I'm an idiot sometimes. I'll just sit there and bang at like a, you know, a, a piece of wood forever and not even know that it's a piece of wood. And I'm like, oh, this is what I gotta move on, right? Because I will sit there and hammer at things that weren't problems. You just have to figure that out. So I did very modest beginnings, um, you know, and what I, what I did have is, you know, you know, what I learned here and what I learned from my mom is like, you know, build strong relationships with people, care. What I didn't learn here that was really important is, is be ambitious. Like, um, I can't tell you how many times people have told me to stop doing what I'm doing with this company. And it's not, like, it's not like your friends that just tell you. Like, it's like people that are like, I will give you money <laughs> to go do something else, you know? Um, and uh, it's just, it's, it takes a certain amount of stubbornness to create the world in your own way. And that's what I, that's what I did you know, pull from here is like the stubbornness that I have blended with like really caring about good people means that um, you go to build good products. But yeah, I mean, um, you could probably read, like, <laughs> figure out other stuff about my dad. I think the Wikipedia page is going to go live soon, and so you can hear all about, like, my family upbringing and stuff. Um, I, I will say it was, I, I, it, was a, it was rough. It wasn't easy. Um, but it wasn't hard. I mean, I had great friends that surrounded me and loved me. And um, I had all the important pieces that make for, like, the right thing. So I guess the, the thing is, is it's, it's all about attitude. I mean, good times and bad times always come inevitably, right? It's, you, it's how you choose to spend the focus on what inevitably hits you that defines who you are. And that's probably the best thing I could say about it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like, I'm out there saying pretty big things to pretty big people, but I'm convinced that I can do it. Not me, but I can get someone to help me, like, pull it off, right? And that's, um, that is the mark of an entrepreneur, I think, is, um, persistence almost, I, I, I laugh and I tell my entrepreneurs all the time, because there's like 180, right? There's a lot of them. Um, and then one of the things I tell them is it's, it, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it matters how you persevere. Because there are a lot of 
dumb, rich people out in the world <laughs> that were great entrepreneurs. And so, like, you know, quit thinking that you're going to outsmart this problem. You know, ears back, really work the problem set, find the solution, and move forward. Um, you know, because it, it, your decisions don't really matter. It's the thing, you're going to fret about decisions all the time. I've got to decide this, I've got to decide that. It doesn't matter. All that matters is what can you execute in a time frame to, to create your success. That is the only thing that matters, right? Um, and if that's like where you are, you'll create pieces where you'll be successful, be successful, be successful, be successful, fail. I mean, tabloids, I didn't even get into this, the failure. I, I ran out of money, right? And I was sitting there looking, do I raise another round? Do I want to go? I put in the bulk majority of the money, probably about 90% of the capital. So there's still some people there that like, because your investors will get mad at you. Things that happen when you fail, like, very important. The last thing, I'll let you guys all eat barbecue or whatever. Um, like when you, when you fail, like you will feel miserable. And I've had friends like commit suicide, like it's really bad, like very well-known, respected entrepreneur guys that were sleeping on my couch when they were raising money. My couch has had a lot of entrepreneurs on it, which is, you know. You will, you know, you will, you will struggle and, and you will fight and uh, inevitably like, you know, when you fail, um, because like there's, people think an exit is a success. No, you exit your startup when you quit <laughs> and just let it go away. When somebody buys you and fires you because you're not like worthwhile anymore, or you go public and then eventually like you get replaced by somebody younger and better at you that they say runs your company better than you, right? So there's never like a, a great, brilliant out to pasture. There's never an exit, right? I mean, I got friends that are rich, but you know, your company fails when you quit and when you give up and when you're done. That's when a company fails, and that's when you finally exit. Um, the way that you build that and the way that you construct your, your life around that um, has to do with a lot of, it, you, you have to be extremely disciplined um, to continue to persevere at any given point in time, right? I think that's probably what the thing that you guys all need to learn, so rambling a little bit. Anyways, thank you guys so much. Any other questions? Wait, wait one, one more question. She got, oh, a personal question? Uh, oh, I, I definitely like river. I grew up on the Illinois River, you know? Um, and the lakes have gotten too green for me. I'm scared of getting in. <laughs> you know, let's clean up our stuff, right? Um, anyways, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm around. I've got plenty of cards, plenty of internships to talk about. So easy to find. Part of the hustle is just to get a hold of me. So thank you. Thank you.